any of your colleagues in the Conservative Party take your view? I think it's quite a sizeable number, actually, in the parliamentary party and in the party at, uh, at large. Um, I'm not going to put a, a number on it because it's very much a moving feast at the moment. We obviously had some clarification from the Prime Minister last weekend about the timing of the triggering of Article 50, this idea of having a great repeal bill. But clearly the, the big issue is going to be the terms on which we leave the EU and the terms of our continuing relationship with EU member states. But just let me ask you about, you know, the number of, uh, I ask you about the number of those that, that, that think this way, but the number who, who feel free to, to speak out, it's almost as if uh, the remains have disappeared within the Conservative Party. We know they were the majority. People like mm. you, people like Anna Soubry mm. are speaking out, but many have uh, headed to the hills. Amber Rudd, I mean, she's now the Home Secretary, uh, bound by collective responsibility, but she was a vocal Remain supporter, yeah. yet she came out with that speech. Were you horrified at conference? Well, I was, I was very surprised that um, Amber had put forward that uh, proposal about the listing of foreign workers, because that's not the Amber Rudd that I know and that I've worked alongside in the, in the Cabinet. And I think it's one of those things, I mean, instantly uh, she was saying and others saying it's a consultation. But the trouble with these sorts of policies is that they send out a message about the, the party, about the way that we want to approach people uh, coming to this country, bring their talents, their skills here. Uh, and I don't think that's a message that we want to send out to the, to the wider world. World. Would uh, you endorse the word repugnant? And that's used by Steve Hilton, former advisor to then Prime Minister David Cameron. Well, I think it's, it, I, I guess I probably would actually. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really um, inadvisable uh, way to proceed. I mean, there's no doubt people do care in this country about the levels of immigration. And I think that uh, we've moved from a position where in 2005, when Michael Howard was party leader in that election, he talked about immigration, and that debate was shut down by the then Labour government. But we appear to have now gone sort of almost, you know, 180 degrees the other way, I suppose, which is that actually now we're, we're now saying well, we're going to, you know, sh shut the borders, we don't want people to come here. And I think that's also not what we want to see as a country. I think Steve Hilton has a point this morning when he writes about having an, an open country about people coming here. Look, I represent a, a constituency with a large international university uh, and they would be at a huge disadvantage if they didn't have academics coming here, if they didn't have students coming here. You know, and we saw the disturbing development on Friday of uh, academics at the LSE being told, unless you have a British passport, you know, we don't want to have you advising the UK government. And that also seems a strange development to me too. And another one uh, picking out from the conference, Jeremy Hunt, another Remainer, of course, uh, coming out with an extraordinary uh, idea that somehow the NHS will become, uh, he, he terms, self-sufficient in, in British staffing in, in 10 years' time. I mean, it's presumably not achievable. Were you surprised he said something like that? Well, I wasn't entirely surprised because there has been a, a debate uh, around the, the Cabinet table about, obviously, Training medical students is a huge investment for this country. Um, and I think we should ask ourselves, why is it that so many, having been trained, then decide immediately to, to go overseas? So what can we do to incentivise people to, to stay here? But again, you see the message you can give is, well, actually, we only want British doctors. We don't want foreign expertise coming here. And it was very interesting listening to some uh, interviews uh, given by people working in the health service over the last couple of days, saying, actually, our health service is stronger because we do have people from overseas. And also, our doctors go overseas again to build up their experience, which they can then bring back, which mm. benefits patients here. So I think all of those, those signals um, are, it's, quite, it's, it's rather confusing when actually what we want to be focusing on is how do we give that message say about being an, an open country that welcomes all talents to come here that we want to do the best thing whether it's for our public services whether it's for our businesses um, and uh, other organizations and making sure they've got access to the best talents possible so you know this question's coming then what can you do do you feel to influence the course of events for instance can you get some kind of parliamentary vote on the process perhaps further down the line and not just on this uh, great uh, repeal bill do you think you can make common cause with people in other parties to do that well look, there's no doubt that there's a, a lot of us in parliament who do feel that it would be extraordinary given that the brexit vote was about the sovereignty of of parliament and of this country in terms of making our laws uh, that phrase of taking back control whatever it means for parliament not to have a big say 
in the Brexit negotiations uh, as they unfold on the guiding principles to be asking questions. You know, I, I hope tomorrow, for example, uh, that uh, you know, a member of the, the Cabinet, whether it's David Davis or somebody else, will come to Parliament and make a statement. That's what normally happens when Parliament hasn't been sitting, when there have been some big developments, as there were over the party conference, the announcements, coming to Parliament to tell Parliament this is the stage that we have got to. And yes, I think there will be common cause between those of us uh, who um, want there to be the right uh, Brexit, the right mechanism for leaving the EU. But the other thing is that the Conservative Party manifesto, on which we were elected only 17 months ago, has a very clear statement in it about we say yes to the single market. And it talks about we will safeguard British interests in the single market. Uh, and that's something that the government cannot ignore, the Conservative Party, my Conservative colleagues, cannot ignore. We stood on a manifesto saying that, as well as saying we'd have a referendum, we would respect the result, which we will, but actually we have to make sure that we do not throw away access to the single market, just because that means talking about free movement. And so labor. further down the line, as a deal comes into shape, you would like to see Parliament retaking sovereignty, Parliament having a decision? Well, that's, I think, what everybody seems to be saying. Campaigners on the Leave side, the Prime Minister was talking about uh, sovereignty of Parliament, Parliament making their own uh, the laws uh, and having a say in this negotiation. And, you know, and, and I think a, a vote. And I think we as members of Parliament are very mindful, even those of us who are very pro-Remain, are very mindful of the vote on the 23rd of June, what people wanted. Uh, the majority, 17 million, have voted to leave the EU. But there is a 48%, there's a 16 million, of whom I've had a lot of contact from in the last few days, saying, you know, please make sure you make the case for the best possible deal. And have you had contact from the former Labour leader, Ed Miliband? We hear he's talking, uh, it's reported in the papers today. He's I talking to Conservatives. No, well, Would I, you like I, to speak I to I haven't. Him? Well, I, look, I will, I will speak to, to, to everyone, um, and uh, because I think this is such a momentous issue for the United Kingdom. I think we can all agree on that. Whatever side of the debate that we're on, this is a huge thing for the United Kingdom. It is going to affect our future for decades to come, which is why we've got to get it right. And I think people expect their members of parliament to be holding the government to account, to be asking those questions. Um, and isn't it interesting that actually you've got people like Pat, you've got people, whether it's Ed Miliband or others, it's not the Labour front bench who are asking those questions. So it's incumbent on others of us to do that. You must be getting a lot of flack from some members of your own party. Actually, I'll say no, and then I'll probably look at my Twitter timeline and look at my inbox after, after that. But uh, I think people understand that it's incumbent on those of us, particularly those who've been in government, who understand how government works, to ask those constructive questions about, do we have the right deal? What are the negotiating principles? Where are we hoping to end up? You know, what damage could we do to our economy? What damage can we avoid doing to our economy? Uh, and that's what we'll be asking. Do you think, I mean, there is a school of thought that says with Theresa May that this was positioning at the Conservative Party conference. She, after all, was a Remainer, maybe technically a Remainer, but she had to then reassure the party that she was going to carry out Brexit. And having reassured them, she now has room for manoeuvre. There are going to be compromises inevitably in these very, yeah. very difficult negotiations. Do you think that's it? It's political tactics. Well, I, I'm sure there's an element of that. I mean, I think that in any party conference uh, speech you, you give, you, know, you think about the audience that's in front of you, the reassurances that people want to hear. But I don't think anyone can doubt from what Theresa May has said from July onwards that she is determined to deliver Brexit. Were you surprised she, she took this such a strong tack, though? Um, not particularly, because I think uh, at the start of a negotiation, you want to set out your, you know, your, your, your stall. Um, but I think other people clearly have been. Look at the markets, look at what's happened to the value of the pound in the last few days. I think there are people uh, who have suddenly woken up to the fact that we are going to have a wholly different relationship with the EU in a matter of, of years. Uh, and that's something that people are going to have to factor into uh, future business decisions. But that's also the other thing, is the uncertainty that is out there. I was out knocking on doors yesterday in my constituency, you know, people saying, well, we don't really know what happens next. I was talking to some farmers on Friday, again, all very uncertain for them. Talking to a food manufacturing business, again, very uncertain for them. Their prices are beginning to go up, the price they're paying for, for products. So it is important uh, that actually, that, that's why I was keen uh, that uh, the government did signal they were going to make progress of this. And last and question, are. I mean, do you think you've got an ally in the cabinet for, for, for that 
viewpoint in, in the Chancellor, in Philip Hammond? Well, I haven't spoken to, to, to Philip, but I know from my time as a Treasury Minister, the Treasury will have a very clear view on what they want to see uh, in terms of negotiations, in terms of tactics that doesn't damage the British economy. Because at the end of the day, that will benefit absolutely no one in this country. The people the Prime Minister says, rightly she wants to support those who are just about managing, are going to be most damaged if our economy you know, is, is, uh, is damaged by Brexit, because that then affects their jobs and livelihoods. Nikki Morgan, good to see you. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed.